thank you everybody for coming. Uh, we're so glad that we have our guest today talking about lymphedema care and the importance of that and also about Lymphacare Hawaii. So welcome to you. We're going to turn it over to you so you can share your slides. And thank you again, Ellie and Rocky, for coming. Thank you. It's wonderful to be here. If you've ever had radiation, surgery or cancer, trauma, burns, infections, or other surgical procedures, particularly involving the arms, legs, or lymph nodes, lymphedema is something you need to know about. Lymphedema is a hidden epidemic. It occurs unnoticed alongside many diseases, including cancer, venous disease, obesity, and conditions that cause immobility. It can develop soon after treatment or may show up many months, years, or even decades later. Although cancer treatments have advanced um, so much, many cancer survivors still develop lymphedema. It's painful, it's depressing, and it stops people from living their best lives. And for some people reaching the end of life, having their symptoms controlled to improve mobility is a priority, as we will see in our case stories. So welcome everyone. As you know, I'm Ellie. I am one of the few experts trained to recognize and treat lymphedema. I know most of you must be tired. I'm thinking right now, great, just what we need, another epidemic. So I am honored that you have taken the time to join us today. And to help you survive, and perhaps myself, this presentation, we will be sharing some useful self-care tips and movements. And if you don't remember anything, please just remember this one thing. The earlier it's identified, the easier it is to treat. And the longer it is left, the more likely it is lead to infection and to become a long-term disease. And it's because patients are not being informed of the risk that they come to us frustrated, exhausted, and very angry. Breaking lockdown was permitted under my RN license, and I was able to keep reaching out to those who called me desperate for help. I did go to patients' homes and nursing homes during COVID, armed in my full PPE. I would like to share some of those patient stories with you, which clearly demonstrate the need for our services. So just a couple of disclosures and roadblocks to share. So in 2017, I did start my private business treating lymphedema under my massage license. My private practice, although grossing less than 30,000 a year now, supports my nonprofit and shares resources so as to keep admin costs to a minimal. So what is all the fuss about, you might be asking? Well, the fuss is there's this gigantic care gap that does exist here in Hawaii. Patients are not getting the right care. And because nobody knows about this disease, my skills are going to waste. Lymphedema patients need our support for self-care. Without ongoing self-care support, our patients regress back to square one and end up in the hospital with infections. Managing lymphedema is similar to having other chronic diseases such as obesity or diabetes. It does demand a change of lifestyle, usually a change of diet and daily maintenance. And like most chronic diseases, it is the Quest population who can't afford to pay privately that really do need this service. And so being trained to identify these care gaps, thanks to my service coordinator experience with Healthways and Ohana Health Plan, I created Lymphocare Hawaii. I am privileged to be doing this work, and in return, it is the most rewarding work I've ever done. This is my driving force. I am currently running with it. And those of you that know me well, know that when it comes to my patient, I go all the way. Lymphedema is a very serious disease, and I'm reaching out to you today because if the palliative community does not get this, then no one will. Why does it matter? It matters because we are all in the quality of life business. 
And we know that for many, the suffering that comes with a disease can often be worse than death itself. Lymphedema can show up any time in our life, at birth or at the end of life. Babies can be born with lymphatic mutation. Let's hear from Rocky now as she tells her story about breast cancer-related lymphedema. I first met Rocky at Queen's when I was called in by her physical therapist to see if I could help manage her long-term swelling. So thank you and over to Rocky and thanks for being here to support Lymphocare Hawaii. Okay, so I was diagnosed in 2016. I had a lump under my arm. I had a clean mammogram two months prior. Um, I had to have surgery, chemo, radiation. My lymphedema didn't occur until almost four years after my diagnosis. I uh, ended up in the hospital. I didn't know what it was. Uh, it turned out to be cellulitis in my arm. Um, same side as the breast cancer. Uh, nobody told me about it. I've had three or four infections a year now for the last three years. Well, I'm going on my third year and I'm currently on an antibody and antibiotic treatment that I take daily um, to keep that uh, infection at bay. Uh, having lymphedema uh, has caused, you know, costs that are not covered by insurance, such as compression garments. Um, I have to wrap my arm at night. I have to do a compression machine uh, to push the fluid through my body. I exhaust all of my PT appointments that I'm um, eligible for, and then I have to go cash pay for lymphedema massage drainage with Kelly. Um, and then I have to buy different kind of clothing because my arm doesn't fit in anything. So, and then I, well, I don't know if this is a good thing or a bad thing, but I can't really clean house because I get all <laughs> heated and swollen. I have to sit down and rest. So I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. <laughs> that's a good thing. I tell all of my patients, you got to get a housekeeper. I if, can't. You, if you clean the windows, it's going to start swelling. <laughs> if you look at this picture here, this was like my second treatment for chemo and my arm looks fine. But in that uh, picture next door, my arm is twice the size of it. So that's just... We just wanted to show you how much difference it has been since chemo and then four years later. Okay, thanks, Rocky. So the Lymphedema Treatment Act has been working hard with Congress for 20 years to get compression garments covered under medical insurance for our patients. Without compression treatment, without compression treatment will fail. I cannot not wear compression. I have to sleep with it. I have to wear it every day. Kathy Bates is a leading spokesperson having lymphedema in both arms after a double mastectomy. Being a fan of her movie, Fried Cream Tomatoes, um, she's also motivated many women um, about having hope for lymphedema. And she speaks on it very publicly. And she has a lot of information on the web which is about what she has to say. But she goes to Congress and she is lobbying. And you don't argue with Kathy Bates, right? <laughs> so she is one of my heroes. So one day, hopefully, we'll get to meet her. So I'm just looking at this slide because it's um, shocking to me that physicians only get one hour or less during their four years of medical training on the circulation and the lymphatic system. Um, I do have to say that many physicians... Oops, sorry. Are, Many of my physicians have never, ever spoken to me about lymphedema from the time I got diagnosis to treatment. Um, five to 17% of women with sentinel, sentinel, sentinel lymph node biopsies can develop lymphedema, which is really shocking for me because working in the Women's Health Center at Queens, we're doing at least 10 to 15 biopsies a day. And I don't think that's ever been. So we know there is no cure um, and that, wow, lymphedema is more common than Parkinson's, multiple sclerosis, rheumatoid arthritis, and HIV combined. Three to five million Americans are 
experiencing some kind of lymphedema in the past. Here's a list of the main causes of lymphedema in the Western world. This slide shows us that in 2009, recent figures in Germany show that obesity related lymphedema is now the main cause in that region. Uh, primary lymphedema is still quite rare, only accounting for 10% of all lymphedema cases. Uh, primary lymphedema is caused when a baby is born with a lymphatic defect and swelling can show up at any stage in their lives. If we look at the numbers, 22% of the secondary cases are non-cancer related reasons and 68% of lymphedema is related to cancer. And then there's me, the 40% breast cancer. Um, so we're gonna hear the stories of other patients and I still have my story to tell you as well. Before that, though, we made this especially for Rocky. So she's become an expert on <laughs> teaching people what they should know about their lymphatic so, system. Ellie has tried to help me understand what I'm going through so I don't get so frustrated because I tell her I don't want to wear my sleeve all the time. When is this going to stop? Um, lymphedema is a disease which affects the lymphatic system, the process by which we filter brain waste fluid from our bodies. If this mechanism stops working, fluid and proteins build up in the tissue. This diagram shows how lymph makes its way into the circulation in a healthy person. Number one, we must first look at the cellular level. Lymph levels leaves the tissue by lymphatic vessels and travels back to the heart to be recycled. The lymph nodes filters the bad stuff. Without removing the proteins, we may get blockages causing fibrosis and swelling. We have all had our sinks backed up. Well, imagine that same blockage in your arm and leg, which is what I'm feeling. Locally, everything downstream will become stagnant and a breeding ground for infection, which is me, because I have to take the antibiotics as a daily medication. Um, so this is why I easily get infections in the swollen parts. Ellie is able to soften that tissue and cause those blockages to drain and reroute the trapped fluid around those blockages. Manual lymphatic drainage is powerful. It can bring large amounts of fluid pumping into the heart. Mary Adams Karem, June Ching, and Nancy Lucky. Please leave a message. Kenneth, oh. the receptionist, will return your call. Somebody's on the phone. <laughs> Keep going. Go with the flow. Uh, so let's see, the fluid's pumping to the heart. That is why if you have unstable heart or kidney disease, it's a big contraindication. Unlike blood circulation, the lymphatic system is a one-way pump to the venous angles, as shown in picture number three, where it dumps excess, excess fluid back into the general circulation and has to rely on deep breathing and muscle movements to siphon the lymph along. Ellie teaches her patients how to breathe and how to move to help drain the lymph at home. Some of us have to do this every day. It's called self lymphatic drainage. So that's me. And we're gonna show you some of the breathing exercises later on. So most therapists use uh, a lymphatic life impact scale to measure the quality of life. The percentage reflects amount, the amount of difficulty and suffering caused by lymphedema. We will be looking at these percentages to see how they dramatically improve after treatment. Oh, and I, I meant to say that there is a ICD-10 code for lipidema, so it must be real, you know. <laughs> so this is me <laughs> oh. uh, identifying who is at risk. Anyone who has a damaged lymphatic system, including cancer and cancer treatment, venous disease, a surgery, drugs, side effects and immobility, such as stroke or older people. So I had 15 lymph nodes removed from under my arm and my lymphedema was caused for that risk of it. So look, look at this picture. I just love this picture. This is me before I met Ellie and the reaction of most people when the word lymphedema is mentioned was I was never told and I have to say nobody explained it to me. Nobody ever, ever told me that the people was going to be a risk from all the treatment and surgery that I've had. I 
had to hear about lymphedema and these infections, infections it can cause when I first got hospitalized in the hospital for an infection. So this was funny because I was running a fever of 104. We couldn't get it down with um, uh, oral meds and it just, COVID just happened. So like nobody wants to touch you when you have a fever. I'm sitting outside of the ER and they're all bound and trying to figure out what's wrong with me. Um, and then they figured out it was uh, an infection. So this is me today. Finally, <laughs> I feel like I'm in charge of the disease. I have control. I know how to take care of myself every day. Like Ellie was saying, I will slip back to square one if I don't keep, keep on track. Um, I understand now that I need to do this to stay healthy, stay out of the hospital, control my infections. And now I can go to the mainland and enjoy a, my retirement. Part of Ellie's work is focus, focusing on teaching people to care for themselves, themselves, especially caregivers, as many crash and burn before the patient does. We are introducing tricuteal movement system, which not only motivates our frail patients to get moving, it also has proven to help the caregivers too. In fact, tricuteal is good for everyone and we're hoping we can convince you of that today. Uh, we do these free classes every Thursday morning. Uh, we usually have 50 or more people joining us from all over the world from, with Zoom and uh, they love the breathing exercises. Just that alone makes you feel like you're, uh, you clear your mind and you feel refreshed and awakened. So and, and Ellie's gonna talk more about that. Okay, thank you, Rocky. So before we do any more slides to wake us all up, I'd love to just show you one of the first movements. So just clear a space. We're going to do it seated. I'm gonna slide back and hopefully you can still hear and see me. So the most important breathing that we use to clear the lymphatics is the diaphragmatic breathing that you probably know from yoga if you do yoga. It's the opposite to what men usually do. When men breathe, they suck it in and hold their stomachs in. We want to do the opposite. So when you breathe in through your nose, you need to learn to inflate your belly like a balloon. So you're gonna breathe in through your nose, inflate your belly and then exhale and your belly comes back down. So that's really difficult for some people to learn how to do, especially for men. As I said, they're used to doing the opposite. So that actually what it does, you remember your, anatom your anatomy with the cisterna child, that little uh, pool where lymph tends to stagnate. The breathing, the motion of the diaphragm um, siphons the lymph, literally pushes it back to those venous angles, back into the circulation and onwards. So really important, deep breathing alone can move the lymph. And then also, as I mentioned, these angles here are really important. This is where it all happens. And as um, certified lymphedema therapists, we're allowed to go in here where all these major vessels are and we manipulate it to help clear it before we start our therapy. So the therapy starts and finishes here. And when I teach my patients at home, what they do is they actually lift their shoulders. And if you put your fingers just above your collarbone, lift your, fin your, your shoulders and squeeze, you feel that space really squeezing. And that's what they do with the breath of joy. So as you breathe into your belly, I want you to raise both arms up, palms facing up to shoulder height, and then squeeze the shoulders and float, exhale back down. Got it? So we'll just try one more. Deep breath into the belly. Both arms come up to shoulder height, no higher. Squeeze and exhale back down. Very good. Okay, on to the next slide. I'm gonna keep everybody awake and energized. So, okay, this patient was referred to me just before lockdown for manual lymphatic drainage, as she had reported bilateral leg swelling. On examination, she did have severe swelling to both legs and a large abdominal ascites 
which she was having drained three times a week. Um, with palliative lymphedema, we really do have to weigh up the burdens of treatments with the quality of life and modify our treatments accordingly. Now for this patient, it was the here and now that really mattered. Her treatment plan was modified with the goals of providing immediate support. So when I met with her at home, she was homebound because of her big old swollen legs. Um, they were like plus three on the way to plus four, full of fluid. The only pain she was having was heaviness and tightness in both legs. And the fact she couldn't take care of herself and her baby was what was really troubling her. And to be honest, with her multiple problems, um, I really wasn't sure why her legs were so, so swollen. And then she had breast cancer and doesn't usually cause swelling in the inguinals. Um, however, she may have had metastases. It may have all been secondary to the um, liver problems that she was also having. Um, but that really wasn't important at the time. It was getting the swelling down so she could get on and enjoy her life. Um, she did report that the manual lymphatic drainage actually gave her good pain relief. It's a very soft, um, pumping, rhythmic touch that we do. Um, and it, it does bring analgesia as well. And she said it energized her enough to get more energy to be with her little toddler. Within a couple of months, with these conservative treatments, we did manage to get her legs down, back to normal actually, which to me was a miracle because as I said, I really wasn't sure what was going on, but whatever happened, it worked and she was very, very happy. Um, there was so much that could be done for this lady and yet she did refuse other medical help and she never did come to terms with that advanced cancer and I'm guessing it was just too painful emotionally for her to ever let go. Um, she did go into remission for several months, but then sadly did pass away within that same year. But what's really striking is the impact score. You know, she had scored 83%. I call it the suffering score. And after the treatments, because she felt like she was normal, she could get her swimming suit on and off she went to the beach. And she said her score went back down to 3%. So that was a very dear patient of mine. Um, next up, this gentleman, um, he was 78 years old and up until recently was very healthy, um, was diagnosed with colon cancer. He lived in a remote part of the woodlands, actually in the mainland with his wife. And I was called long distance by his daughter during lockdown, desperate for help managing his right leg swelling, as you can see here in the picture, which was distressing him. It was heavy, full of fluid, and it was leaking out everywhere. And he was really terrified because he didn't know what it was. And he honestly thought his leg was just going to open up and explode with fluid. And you know, that's terrifying for people. So using FaceTime, on my phone, hours and hours, um, I was able to teach the daughter gen gentle um, self manual drainage moves, which did provide the analgesia and deep relaxation. This patient's short term goal was to relieve the pain um, and just to, be get, to get to the bathroom to have his mobility back. And just knowing that somebody was able to tell him what it was and explained to him, you know, his leg wasn't gonna explode, just really reduced his anxiety and fear, making him more comfortable. So I instructed his daughter how to support his leg with some simple short stretch bandaging techniques to reduce the pressure pain and also manage that troublesome weeping lymphoma. His daughter said that she felt useful in this otherwise hopeless situation. Her father, passed away several days later, comfortable as he had wanted without any pain medications. I donated several hours supporting this family, but this is the type of work that we all do as hospice nurses that you just cannot put a price on. And even though he was in the end stage dying phase, his impact score went down from the 90s into the 30s. And next, this smiling face, this is Mikey. Here's a dear friend of mine, an advocate for the head and neck cancer community at Queen's Medical Center. 
his stressful experience of being lost in the medical center, in the medical system motivated me to actually advocate and make this my specialty. So Mikey had a radical neck dissection, um, developed stage two lymphedema after surgery, getting on an airplane, flying off to see his daughter. Again, he wasn't told of the risk. And when getting on an airplane without compression is one thing that will trigger lymphedema in the early stages. But with diligent help from the Queen's medical team and rehab hospital, along with his daily stretches and exercising, the swelling is now controlled, as you can see in this picture. Um, Mikey continues his journey of recovery by giving back to others, sharing his knowledge with the newly diagnosed warriors that attend the Head and Neck Cancer Support Group. Mikey did go through hell, but he made it to the other side. He appears talking to Rocky more about his experience in our homemade promotional video found on the front of our webpage. After several months, Mikey was able to get his life back. And what was really important to him was to be able to get in the water and surf again. His score dramatically went down to 13, and it's probably a lot lower now. This dear elderly gentleman found me on Google search after being discharged from Queen's Medical Center with cellulitis. His discharge instructions said to follow up with his vascular team, which he did. During the initial assessment on examination, both legs were very red and excoriated, as you can see from these ugly pictures. I couldn't tell what was going on. It looked like there was infected eczema, some underlying fungal infections, maybe some psoriasis. He looked like one of those homeless people that you see with infected legs and the bandages trailing behind them. He was still riding the bus and leaking fluid everywhere. Life was very miserable for Mr. James because again of the weeping fluid, mostly from behind his knees, and there's no way he could keep a bandage on it. And he had terrible itching, causing him to scratch all night and reinfect himself. This poor man also had scrotal lymphedema, which had not been seen by anyone because he was too shy and afraid even to tell anybody. Well, I sent him back to his medical team. However, there was no improvement and he was being seen by vascular dermatology and infectious diseases. And he pretty much was told there was nothing to worry about. But during lockdown, we became good friends and I did all his treatments pro bono as he did appear to be in such bad shape with no family around. We did a joint home visit with my um, colleague, Dolly Foley at the Compression Garment Expert. And together we made a plan for Mr. James. We helped his PCP get the right referral into the lymphedema clinic and later to the wound clinic for treatment of his reoccurring ulcers. Lastly, to maintain the swelling, a lymphopress machine was ordered. Uh, that's the type of pump that Rocky had mentioned earlier. And um, we pretty much cons uh, consulted him to, to help manage his own drainage with that pump. You can see in these after pictures, the before and six months after, I mean, it's just amazing the impact that this made. So after six months, he was ready to go. And for him, it was just really finding the right people and getting him connected. Mr. James was an amazing gentleman. We became very good friends. And after six months, he felt well enough to get on an aeroplane and he left the mainland. Before he left, he had a twinkle in his eye and he gave me a check for $5,000 well, I nearly fell over because I just couldn't imagine it. And he pledged to me that there'll be more to come. Well, he said, my dear, you shall have your lymphedema clinic and we shall rename it after my mother. Well, he returned to the islands a couple of months later and had agreed to be on the board, on the board as a member for um, Lymphocare Hawaii when we first got started to help fulfill our mission. But sadly, he did pass away. That was the last time I saw him. He passed away quite suddenly during COVID lockdown, but um, we remember him very fondly and he, he was just a lovely man. Lastly, I wanted to share a story of a couple that I am treating at the moment. So this is 
Um, this is a poor mother and her daughter both have lymphedema, which has not been diagnosed. Well, it had not till I saw them a couple of weeks ago. So the mother is in her 80s, she's homebound, she's a typical nursing home patient, chronic med problems. Um, this is the photo that they sent me. And I just took one look at it and I said, yes, you have lymphedema, you need to come and see me. After speaking to her, um, some of the red flags went up. You can see she's had that knee replacement. She's been on long-term steroids. Um, she was on calcium channel blockers, which can be another problem. They slow down the lymph in the actual vessels. And she's now got an infected womb. The daughter is struggling also uh, with stage three advanced ovarian cancer, um, suffering from caregiver burnout, and then also has developed lymphedema due to surgical scarring. So again, um, it's not the doctor's fault because the doctors do not get training on this. And when I wrote a letter kindly to the PCP explaining what I was seeing, uh, making some suggestions, and he was overjoyed that I was there to help. And so we're working as a team to get both of these patients to the right. Okay, so tripudia movement time again. Um, as I was mentioning, supported self-care is paramount for these people. And we are currently running three classes here at St. Francis, thanks to Cowie. It's been wonderful helping us with this platform every Thursday, 11 to 12, and you can sign on for free on our website. So sitting around at a desk is the worst thing you can do for especially lower leg edema. So it's time for another breath of joy. If you want to stand up and join me, you can. But we're going to do three breaths now. And you remember, you're going to take a deep breath into your abdomen. And with first breath, lift your arms, take a deep breath in. Palms facing up, shoulders squeeze, and exhale back down. Very nice. Second breath. Deep into your abdomen, arms come up, and float back down. Third breath. Deep breath in, squeezing at the neck, and floating back down again. Well done, everyone. And we usually do the whole sequence to music, and it is a lot of fun. Right, so now we're heading out on a trip to see what the rest of the world is doing about lymphedema and palliative care. So grab your suitcase and we're going to hop over the pond to jolly old England. And we have landed in the coast of the UK, my home county, Dorset, a seaside county with magical coastlines, swaying palm trees. Yes, we do have palm trees and golden sandy beaches. It has the world's most expensive row of coastal houses in the world. There's 13 houses, whoops, go back. There's 13 houses that amount to over $100 million collectively. And uh, only the rich and famous live in those houses, beautifully landscaped there on the channel where the water's coming by. And I know all you Costa, Costco shoppers will be really interested to know that coastal cheese comes from my hometown in Dorset. It's from um, the Ford Farm, aged to perfection and has a crunch of natural calcium crystals. So there we are. Dorset is about the same size as Hawaii. And we're going to just see now how that compares so there's some statistics on the area square miles and population. I know Hawaii is about 600 square miles, about a million people. Well, in Dorset, we have four really good palliative symptom control centers. They're not called hospices um, because hospice and palliative care is pretty much one thing in England. They're freestanding and they are in residential neighborhoods, um, very much part of the community. They each cover a set region, so they're not competing against each other for referrals, and they rely heavily on community support. There is no six months guidelines that I mentioned that we have here, um, as the services are all merged into one service. And it's like an additional layer of care on top of what already exists. So it's care provided by specialist nurses and doctors. So this was my profession for the five years before 
I came over to America. So I was a Macmillan nurse, specialty nurse, um, doing home visits for palliative hospice patients. And of course, we all rely on serious fundraising from adventure corporate days, local celebrities. You may uh, recognize our beloved Doc Martin here. That's Martin Clunes. He lives in Dorset and he helps us raise money. Um, the local retail store makes, well, hundreds, thousands. It makes a bomb. And uh, not forgetting, of course, lots and lots of tea parties to raise that money. And each of our um, freestanding centers, you will find these services. They all have a lymphedema clinic because it's part of palliative care services. They even have a breathless clinic for people that are having problems breathing. Um, during the end of life. They have um, wonderful services called palliative arts, and that includes massage, Reiki, aromatherapy, yoga, art therapy, music therapy, just about everything. And the other thing they have is a day hospice. That's something that's quite remarkable where patients come in, so they have respite for the day, so they can um, their families can get a respite. And now a quick look at our beloved St. Christopher's up in London. The building isn't so pretty from the front. Um, it is roughly twice as much in square miles and population, and they do handle around about twice as many people up there. Um, they do have lovely gardens at the back, and they have a wonderful day hospice called the Creative Living Centre. Here's a quick rundown of how many people they saw last year. Any information you want to know about them, you can just click on any annual review from any hospice and tap into all of this information. Um, on this slide, I just want to quickly show that St. Christopher's, one of their goals is still to transform end of life globally there in blue on the, on the right hand side. Um, and as a side note, I don't know if anybody would remember, but I actually received a grant to go back to St. Christopher's when I was working as a nurse for Hospice Hawaii way back in 2007, I think it was. Um, when I showed up, everyone was a bit confused from Hawaii. There were a few other Americans there, but we went back to learn how to set up palliative care services. Um, one of the things I distinctly remember, which I didn't understand back then, but I understand what she was meaning now, is one doctor said, well, you know, it's all right for you offering these services, but we can't do that in Hawaii or America because we're governed by the Medicare guidelines. However, I am hoping with palliative care, perhaps coming under the state funding, that some of those guidelines can be stretched, maybe the goalposts could be moved, and a lot more services can be incorporated. So St. Christopher's, if you go on the website, they have an amazing, uh, robust service for international ed educational programs. They're, they're there to help everyone. They've been a beacon worldwide, and as they say, they're much more than just a hospice. There is a short three minute YouTube video available, you can Google, we're going to put it in the chat bar at the end, for CARE, so it's the Centre of Awareness and Response to End of Life. This is a £6.5 million, which is probably about $9 million building that's been built by the community to help outreach so that everyone really comes together to understand, explore and to become educated, not just for clinicians, but as I said, it's for anybody. I, for one, will be visiting this year. And then, as you know, I did mention I happened to have tea with Dame Cicely Saunders while I was there. Um, she was still working back in the 90s. And I don't remember much about her. Um, she didn't show up too many times, but she was a very tall, religious lady. Um, she was always happy to talk to people. And I was officially anointed with that cup of tea which you like to have with all the new nurses in the library. <laughs> but that was very special to me. You know what we're like, our ceremony with the tea. So back in the day, um, one of our famous circus owners passed away at St. Christopher's. And before he died, he really wanted to see his favorite elephant. So there was great excitement, I'm told, when this elephant made its way into the lobby. I'm not sure if they got it in the elevator. 
But this elephant, uh, this elephant was loved by everyone. It used to actually go around the children's hospitals and give rise to the nurses and patients. <laughs> So you wouldn't want to have that one on the loose. And then the other picture shows um, there's this really wonderful dog, the St. Bernard dog that used to live at St. Christopher's and he delighted the children in the garden, giving them rides. So it was a fun place. And here's me. Um, this is morning report at St. Christopher's back in the 90s. As you can see, I've got my mug of tea armed there and uh, sat next to one of the most important people in our team, physical therapist, because um, palliative people, they do want to keep moving and uh, focusing on those goals is paramount. But my favorite memory of all, and still is the Jolly Trolley. So instead of Roxanol, we use various strengths of Oromorph. They still do. It's a liquid that starts in about 10 milligrams per five mils. So if you're on a big dose, you actually have to swallow quite a lot of it. Um, you piled all these bottles onto a trolley that looked very much like this one and went down the hallway, giving out the all and more every four hours. Then after we'd finished, uh, we returned back to the drug room where everything was locked up, put all the all and more away, opened the next cabinet, that was full of alcohol and cocktails, filled up the same trolley and then rattled down the hallway saying, would anyone like a beverage? And it always reminded me of being on British Airways, um, just, just so comical. You know, and when I went back recently, they still do this. The British still would like a cocktail with their morphine. <laughs> and why not? And so, um, so St. Christopher's, you know, is the mecca for palliative care. The Foldy Clinic is uh, the mecca for lymphedema. They are the world leaders in education and care for lymphedema. So here in Germany, they do take swelling and lymphedema very seriously. And it's covered as a four week inpatient stay with a multidisciplinary team involving doctors, dietitians, psychologists, nurses, physical therapists. One good thing about COVID was that I was able to participate globally in all the lymphology conferences and get to meet with the world experts. And you can just take a look, 152 patients seen in those beds and it is true, the last conference I attended last year, they did say they're not seeing hardly any cancer patients. It's mostly morbid obesity related lymphedema that goes to this clinic now. And here we are back with Tripudia Movement System. So as a thank you to all our palliative care clinicians, um, I'd like to offer you all some free Tripudio movement classes. Just let me know when you'd like to start, when you'd like to get together, and we can form our own group. Um, we can broadcast here from St. Francis or from somewhere else. But I would love to help you move on with having to take care of yourselves. And now Rocky will be reading a few more slides. <laughs> <laughs> so we're happy back over to America and back to Hawaii. To talk about palliative lymphatic care. So in contrast, unlike the European clinics, we don't advertise at the Dilla Clinic in any hospital state. I had to come up with another way to continue my treatment after exhausting my PT hours, and my physical therapist told me it was only them. Well, thank goodness she knew about me. Yeah, nobody else knows about me. And um, we figured it out. Yes. We? Yes. So, you know, Ellie has helped me to come up with a plan that I can do myself. She's motivated me to, to stick with it. She's um, empowered me to feel like I am in control. And now I'm living my best life. Thank you, Ellie. So with support, Patients like Rocky and Mr. James are no longer lost in the healthcare system and they can now take care of themselves. 
These services are not a duplication of any other service already provided. We need funding to provide these services to support our patients because none of it is covered under insurance. It's a strictly cash basis. If anyone has any good ideas, we'd love to hear from them while we start applying for grants. And here is a short list of the things we are actively actually doing now, the movement classes, free screening, navigation to a specialist, that often takes me hours, um, follow up phone calls, and I do have a small grant for some financial assistance to get those compression garments. Because if you remember, if they don't get those garments, treatment is going to fail. And here's just a very quick slide on the classes I put together. This one is an overview of um, why quality of life matters. I would love to come to the hospices, palliative care centers to show the caregivers, the aides, the nurses, actual hands-on care and what you can do to help these people that are having pressure pain or leaking fluid coming out of their bodies. Um, the inconvenient truth about lymphedema, obesity related lymphedema and how to tell it from another lymphatic disease called lipedema which is on the uprise. Um, venous related lymphedema. I would love to hook up with anyone in the vascular field. I don't know any venous doctors. The only doctors I know are more interested in arterial kind of work. Um, and then also self-management of lymphedema, which includes the trichodial movement systems. And we're finishing up, we're on the homeward run now. So back in 2017, I spearheaded the annual proclamation at the Capitol to have Hawaii recognize March the 6th as World Lymphedema Day. You may recognize a few smiling faces there. Um, the therapists are wearing the blue and white lei. One of them actually flew over from Maui. And I'd like to give a big shout out for Sherry Teranishi Hashimoto there. She is in the navy blue, third one from the governor. And Sherry was the lady that took me under her wing. She is my mentor. She's our guru of lymphedema here in Hawaii. And she works out of rehab hospital in the um, Cancer Rehabilitation Center. Um, and she's on the board members for lymphedema, uh, Lymphocare Hawaii. And a very big thank you to Kakua Ma for hosting Lymphocare Hawaii to St. Francis for allowing us to use their studios, for Rocky, as always, for volunteering and sharing her story so willingly, and also to all our patients. So um, none of the photos show facials, except for Mikey, and he expressly said we could show his cute little face and smile, he's very proud of it. And uh, all the information I'm giving you today is uh, research evidence-based. I've done a lot of research, um, I'm not a professor, but I know many people that are, and those are the people that I go to to get my information. So, um, as you can see, very obsessed, very passionate about this work, and this is where you will find us. So, just to finish up, thank you again for your time, and we're happy to answer any questions. And that is it from us. I shall stop sharing, shall I? Well, thank you very much, Ellie and Rocky. Uh, that was very well done. And certainly, um, I'm, I'm hoping there will be questions, but thank you so much for the time and all of this great work that, you, that you're doing. So if people can be collecting their, their questions, there are two that have come in. Anita wanted to know, uh, what's the ICD code from a prior slide? Oh. Um, I should know off the top of my head, but I can't use codes. I think it's, um, want to go back? Yeah, we might have to go back. It's zero, uh, you can Google it, 1.89, I believe. I have to go back to the beginning. Um, yeah, so only the OTs, the PTs are allowed to use the ICD codes because they are, um, under, under Medicare, that is billable. So here it is. The work I do, is not billable, so I cannot use that code. Right, sorry, almost almost there. One eight nine point zero. That's general lymphedema. 
And then her next question was, how do patients find you? Exactly. You know, they usually Google me. They're so savvy, these patients. Even, <laughs> even Mr. James, 89, he managed to find me. And let me tell you, I have people within your healthcare systems, Queens, Papilani, Straub Hospital. I've had people call me asking me where their lymphedema clinic is. So that's really sad, isn't it? Um, my, my website, basically, everything is on my website, which was on that last slide. Um, if you punch in lymphedema, it will probably spell check lymphoma. Disregard that. Put lymphedema in again, um, le-solutions.org. I will come up under my LLC. She's also seeing patients actively at rehab. So, it's all cash based. Though. Yeah, so that's the only place where I'm based um, for my LLC, my company where I charge patients, uh, rehab, hire me as an independent contractor, and they charge $80 an hour for that treatment. I do mm -hmm. see patients at home under special circumstances, and the charge is usually about 100 plus for the time around and all the COVID cleaning. Yeah. Uh, we have a question from Danielle. Hi, Danielle. Aloha. That was an amazing presentation. Oh, um, Danielle, you're the massage therapist, yes? I am, yeah, and I'm on Big Island. And so uh, my questions are uh, related to that. When, how do people contact you or what do you, you know, do you travel to treat them? And um, like how, how can we coordinate together? Yeah, yes. yeah, that's a big thing. That's so a great question. It is a great question. So, you know, when I was, I was actually told to go find those lymphedemic clinics and I couldn't find them. That's the silly thing. So when you phone a hospital or a clinic and you say lymphedema, they usually say lymph for what? And then that's the end of the conversation. And then you go round and round all these different departments. I know there are more out there, private physical therapy departments that run their own. Um, but here's the thing, uh, they have to be run by certified lymphedema therapists. And in order to become one, you have to have that extended training like myself. You can do it as an RN or, or a massage therapist, but you will not be able to bill under Medicare. So when somebody comes to me, I say to them, okay, you know, what's your insurance? Let's get into the clinic. Where do you live? Let's find the nearest clinic. So Queens, I say, okay, let's get to Queens. I help them get the referral. Whilst they're waiting, maybe eight, 10 weeks to get in there, they might pay to come and see me privately. I don't travel into Ireland. Once I get my million dollar grant, I will. <laughs> some um, information from you Danielle so that if there's patients we can refer to you it's nice to have somebody to say there's somebody with you because we don't know a lot of other people that can really train to do it um, I have to say that many of her referrals have been coming from physical therapists from patients who have nowhere else to go now because they're exhausted all of their um, eligibility and then she's had a few from some acupuncturists where they've tried to treat and uh, not as successful as they would like. She, they would say, well, let's see if Ellie can help. And it, yeah, it's actually quite um, shocking when I see people, to me, you know, with the training, it's so obvious what's going on. And acupuncture can be an contraindication. So people just, you know, trying to help. Sometimes they're not doing the right thing. Um, and I just wanted to caution Danielle also, um, don't get caught up in what you may have learned through massage school. It must, and there's another big misunderstanding out there in the community that confuses everyone because, you know, as massage therapists, we do lymphatic drainage. That is only for a healthy person. So it's for like a D 
detox, healthy kickstart on your lymphatic system that's already intact and knows how to look after itself. What we do is we work on people where they have a problem and a damaged system. So in order to work on these people, you have to be licensed and certified. And as I said, you know, I spent all my savings, flew to the mainland, got all the certification, and now it's really difficult to get connected with people. Does that make sense? Danielle, do you know other practitioners? No, that's not the issue. I've had multiple different patients come to me in that same realm that they're, they don't find anybody. And I'm, um, the manual lymph drainage courses I took were not towards a certification, but they were separate. They weren't just the run of the mill massage school stuff. Right. So it's slightly more medical and has worked with some people and yet has not been, yeah, like you're saying, connected to the greater picture, um, partially because people don't want to pay for it out of pocket. So we're in a, we're in a conundrum. We'll, we'll figure it out. <laughs> Hopefully I'm going to get around it before I die. <laughs> Um, well, thank, thank you. Rachel, Rachel Porter said she wanted to uh, contribute. Rachel, can you? Yes, I would just like to say that uh, my husband had lymphedema um, as a result of colon cancer. It was totally undiagnosed and he looked just like the pictures that you showed. I mean, it was, it was really quite grave and we had no resources. The doctors couldn't even, I decided that it was lymphedema, but I couldn't even get any kind of operation from our doctors. So I was out in left field doing YouTube videos on manual lymph drainage massage myself. And it did seem to help him with even, you know, no skills whatsoever, but um, so important this work that you're doing. And so I'm so glad to know, because I will certainly refer anybody who looks like they might be a candidate for this, because my experience is doctors don't know what it is. And we got some really bad advice from our medical team about what to do about it. So it, thank it, you. Like so I much. said, it's not their fault. We can't blame the doctors. Yeah. yeah we can't blame them. They no, really they have not had career. Yeah. So we need to change that as well. Yes, absolutely. And you know, the thing is, um, a lot of this we knew in Europe 10, 20 years ago, and it was more an instinctive, intuitive knowing. Now, in the last two or three years, they've got the machinery, they can put the scans on, and they can see one of the links that I've put there. Um, do try and click on that. It's fascinating. So it shows me, not me, but a therapist doing the manual lymphatic drainage in real time under um, fluoroscopy. And you'll see with the movement that the lymph, which has been lit up with a dye in green is moving. So, you know, when patients see it actually moving when they do their muscle pumping, it's there, it's real. So um, I think doctors that do those lymph node, um, the mapping is the same type of thing when they, they do the central node, they're able to see the lymph node system. Um, there are some nurses in um, Australia, there's a couple in England that use those as diagnostic for someone that has a difficult problem like Rocky, the blockage, and I can only assume where it is, but if you have one of those machines, you can actually see where the blockage is. But again, it's not FDA approved, um, it runs the risk of injecting dye into the system, and you really don't want to do that unless you have to. So I hear you, yeah. Thank you for your comments. Thank so you. as a, as a non-clinical person, I, I just am really surprised that this is not more mainstream. Mm. So what is the, why is that? <laughs> <laughs> well, <That's> you know, <laughs> sorry, but like, if you look at people, the background, <laughs> right? what's going on and uh, i'm interested of course in changing the system let's i you know kukuma we're about changing the system but help me understand what is the what's the issue here or issues plural the issue here issues. in america like i mentioned is there's people like myself that are passionate to do this work but there is no tick box for an rn massage therapist to get paid under medicare for this work so if we can't get paid for it, we don't do it's it. It's not on the radar. It's not on the radar, right? Yeah. And then if patients that need it can't afford to pay us cash, they're not going to be interested either. 
So yeah. that's that's the conundrum. So that, that part I understand. We have to pay people to do work. That much I understand. It just seems to me that, you know, certainly what you were talking about and people's experience, like why, why are Americans different than Germans and British people in terms of recognizing yeah, right. this? Well, it's just a bit behind, that's all. It's um, catching up. You know, okay. and, and Jeanette, the, the lymphatic system, there's so little research, money being put into research. But mm-hmm. now they're really finding out so much more with technology, especially looking at viruses and how the lymphatic system clears viruses and bacteria. And, you know, and they recently discovered that our brain has a separate lymphatic system. So all the all the people in the dementia world and neurological world are all terribly excited because, again, it's draining all the bad stuff out of our brains. So I just want to say that I know my surgeon today doesn't take out 15 lymph nodes anymore. Mm. Just because and um, she's taking out less and less and trying to do, um, I, I think they do this dye thing now where they can see if the lymph node is infected with cancer or not before they remove it. So um, there is, is some change happening, but I still don't think that there's enough to talk about the risk at that time of treatment. Just hope it will appear maybe. That's what how I felt like they yeah. said, well, we're only going to deal with it if it shows up. Yeah. Well, yeah. other than that, yeah. it's true. I do a whole nother talk on um, all the misconceptions and all the taboos yeah. out there on lymphedema and why doctors don't want to talk about it. So yeah. that's quite an interesting talk. That's another hour thing. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, my doctor gave me water pills to get from a pus swelling down. And that is the worst thing you can do for the edema. Yeah. He wanted me to try. And then I started getting cramping and I started getting nausea and dizzy because some of the good stuff was leaving too. I was low in potassium, low in sodium because I was peeing it all out and my arm was still fat. So what, no ha- yeah, so what happens with the uh, diuretics, the water leaves, but the protein doesn't. Right. But actually, it makes it worse. Now the proteins in your system are more concentrated, and they're going to start laying down fibrosis quicker. Mm. So it's probably not a good idea unless they're giving it some other, you know, comorbidity for right. that patient. Um, I can talk for hours about <laughs> yeah. Venus no. patient. Don't get me started on the Venus patients. So my only um, exercise that I do every day is swimming. It keeps me cool, so I don't get overly heated because that causes my lymphedema to inflame and it helps me get exercise that I need to get right. from my heart so swimming is a great thing that was my physical therapist's idea it's and, wonderful and it does do a good I, I know when I get out of the water my arms seem to be the same I don't know what the pressure of the water does but it's it magical does. So you think about it, going up in an aeroplane is a contraindication, but swimming, when you've got more pressure on your um, skin, when your body's moving and pumping, it's, it's working harder. So if you do any exercise other than swimming, you have to wear your garment. So, you know, who wants to wear a garment in the heat? Right. Well, this has been really interesting, and maybe we can say a thank you and turn off the recording, and then we can keep going. So again, thank you so much for sharing uh, all of this wisdom with us. So thank you very much. Thank you.